to thank uh, organizers, Abhishek, Sriram, and all the other ones. Uh, for again, in India, it's a pleasure to come back. And as someone said uh, yesterday, certainly a very timely topic we are discussing uh, during this meeting. So I would like to tell you uh, about our understanding of universal features of driven and active systems. So this will not be so much about any individual system. I will use those only for illustrations of general um, theorems, general results, which hold for all of these, of these systems. So for a start and introduction, I'll recall very briefly the basic idea of stochastic thermodynamics, the two paradigms. Especially, I can focus in this talk on non-equilibrium steady states, and I'll prepare these slides basically also for the grad students, but since we already had some discussion on this, uh, this will be brief. The first main part will then be about something we discovered about uh, two and a half years ago, which we called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. And I'll try to convince you that this is really a new relation which I think is potentially, in a sense, more useful than the fluctuation theorem to study uh, these systems. And then I'll talk about more recent work. Uh, this was actually, this work about entropy production of active particles was with Patrick Pitsonka, who is a grad student just finishing, and he got already a postdoc position for next year, but Andre Barato, who was working with me on this uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relation and still is working with me, uh, he's postdoc, currently distinguished postdoc in Dresden, and he still needs a permanent job. So if you need an excellent uh, scientist for faculty, I can recommend Andre very well. Okay, so let's get started. As I said, we can focus here on non-equilibrium steady states, and one of the paradigms is this driven colloidal particle driven across the periodic potential. This one here is an enzyme, the F1 ATPase, which is our cells producing ATP, the fuel for all other biological processes. And uh, typically, this can also be constantly driven here in the cell by proton gradients across the membrane. And this is a cartoon of the beautiful experiment Ajay Sood was telling us in his first lecture. Characteristic for non-equilibrium steady states are, is the fact that they, there's a time-independent driving, or activity if you want to uh, distinguish between these two concepts, which in my opinion you don't really need to. Um, so there is time-independent driving beyond linear response of some equilibrium system. So we are, we are deep in the non-equilibrium realm. Detail balance is broken, which leads to persistent currents with permanent dissipation. And this, all these systems will run into a well-defined steady state, stationary state, but this state is, of course, not given by the Boltzmann distribution. So these are the general, the general features. Okay, so the first paradigm of stochastic thermodynamics are Langevin type equations. So in this situation, and typically under the time scales uh, which are observable, you can focus on the overdamped case. The velocity is given by the mobility times the total force. Total force is gradient in the potential or and some non-conservative force. Then there is the usual noise, because all these systems, and this is important to keep in mind, I'm talking about wet systems, all these systems are embedded in aqueous solution, so there's always, inevitably, there is uh, noise, and the strength of this noise is related to the mobility via the Einstein uh, relation. Then about 20 years ago, Ken Sekimoto pointed out that you can cast Langevin equations of this type into the form of a first law, if you identify terms properly and in the situation where the potential is constant, applied work is just force times displacement, internal energy is position within this potential, and then this blue box, the first law, will work if you identify heat as the difference, which turns out to be the applied force times the displacement. And of course, that's something which you would have naively guessed anyways. But the key point is here. All these quantities are now defined along a fluctuating trajectory. So look at this point that the particle will fluctuate along such a trajectory. These quantities fluctuate. Now, 
Heat dissipated heat in the bath can be related with an entropy change of the medium, so here you get a fluctuating contribution to the entropy of the medium. Now, it turns out that this is not the only entropy change you have to keep in mind. There is a second contribution, which I call stochastic entropy some time ago, which formally you get by looking at the increment of the log P. P is the solution of the Fokker-Planck equation. So, as you know, the Langevin dynamics can be also described by a Fokker-Planck equation. Of course, you have to specify initial distribution. And then the stochastic entropy is just this increment. And then you can easily prove that if you look at the total change of entropy along a trajectory, you put it in the exponent, you average over any initial condition, any type of driving, any length of driving, you always get this, uh, what is called the integral fluctuation relation for total entropy production. This is the uh, first paradigm. Second paradigm are discrete systems. These systems with discrete states, and this is somewhat more abstract here. So, for instance, different enzyme configurations, like the Bashi Shauduri spoke about in the first talk. Um, so you have this set of states, you have transition rates. In principle, you can choose the transition rates as you want, but you have to make sure that your model is thermodynamically consistent. All these enzymes are embedded in an aqueous solution at 37 degrees in our bodies. And this implies that the ratio between forward and backward rate between any two pairs of states has to be of this form where H is a thermodynamical driving field or force. So for a mechanical transition, for instance, if that transition was associated with moving against the force F, it would be force times distance. So these d quantities are generalized distances. These fields are thermodynamic forces, which could be real force. It could be the chemical reaction, uh, delta mu of a chemical reaction associated uh, with this transition. So it, this is really key that you have to always implement such a I mean, such a condition on the on the rates. And then you get uh, mean currents between any two pairs of states. We will later look at fluctuating currents or empirical currents. That's just the number of transitions, the net number of transitions divided by time. And then, as in the Langevin case, you can also identify entropy production somewhat formally. The key point is that each jump, each transition, has a certain contribution. Okay. Now, uh, just one example. Once you have this set up, you have... For non-equilibrium steady state, a mathematical theorem, which you can prove once and then it's done for all times, which is called the fluctuation theorem. So originally found in numerical studies by Evans and co-workers, was then proven various forms of dynamics, chaotic dynamics, stochastic dynamics by Kuchan and Leibovitz and Spohn. And if you include the stochastic entropy, the boundary terms, this relation, which in the early days was only a long time relation, this relation will hold in finite times. And of course, it's nice to have something in finite times because experiments take place in finite times. <laughs> okay, just one example. Uh, in this situation here, the red distribution, this is the distribution of total entropy production after two seconds. The black one is after 20 seconds. Um, these are non-Gaussian distributions. They are not universal. They have, can have any shape, but the ratio, the log ratio, has to obey this relation. So typically in this representation, you get this slope. And you should get constant slope independently of how long you measure. Okay, this is a theorem in the sense there is no need to experimentally verify a theorem. So what you do in experiments when you test, quote unquote, this, is you test whether your experimental system or your numerical, uh, numerical simulation complies with the assumptions which went into deriving this, this, this theorem. But th th there is a but. You have, of course, to obey the conditions which I stated, which means that when you evaluate this entropy production, you include all relevant degrees of freedom. And what happens if you don't? This is something which goes under this notion of slow uh, degrees, hidden degrees of freedom. And in this study with Clemens Bechinger, 
we looked at this um, in a somewhat paradigmatic situation. So you have the two of these systems. Both particles are driven. The particles are paramagnetic. So when you look from top, when you have a magnetic field, you have some interaction between these two particles. Now, when you look at the total entropy production, and this is an equivalent form uh, of the expressions I had earlier, where this nu is the velocity conditioned on the position. That's an important quantity. There's no doubt that the total entropy production for whatever parameters you choose will obey the fluctuation theorem. But now suppose you do not see the second ring, or you don't even know that there is a second ring. So if you just look at the first one, you have, of course, then uh, identify entropy production from the first one. And if you just apply the recipe, which you would do if you just you know, took this expression naively, the question is, does it? And of course, there's no reason why it should. But when you do the experiment uh, some time ago, we found um, distributions like this. So the black is, yes, I, I should emphasize that the advantage of this setup is that you, if you control the uh, magnetic field, you control the strength of this coupling. So without the field, there is essentially no coupling, and each of the systems is its own separated genuine non-equilibrium steady state. So if you now look at these distributions, either with, which is the red one, or without, which is the black one, uh, coupling, and you plot it, there was the first surprise that even when you apply the coupling, you still find a straight line. And when I saw this first, I said, okay, that's nice, but uh, you, you know, that can't be all of the story, and you better look for some other parameters. And then it turned out that you had to work quite hard, both in experiments and even when we did simulations, to find a situation where this uh, fluctuation theorem, now just for the first entropy, I mean entropy production from the first one, apparent entropy production is violated. So here you see, I mean around the origin you always have a, a, a slope, that's because of this logarithmic ratio is anti-symmetric, but uh, in general, you would expect that it's just some anti-symmetric function, and indeed you can find cases where, it, where it's not just the slope over the range where you can measure. But there was a, already, in, in, in this case, there was a hint that something strange is going on. When you plot this slope as a function of the coupling strength, well, it goes down, that may be fine, but uh, the more shocking fact was that this slope would depend on the time over which you evaluate uh, this entropy production. But the general message is, if you have hidden slow degrees of freedom, they will typically spoil the fluctuation theory. Oh, special parameters. Special parameters, so let's say in the, in the most part of the parameter space which was accessible, we would find something like this. Um, this fact that this apparent slope is, becomes a function of time, which it would not in, if the conditions were fully valid, was also found in a related experimental earlier study by this Japanese group, where they tried to use the fluctuation theorem to infer the torque this F1 molecule can exert. So the experiment is such that you take this F1 part, you put it on a cover slip, you provide ADP in excess, and then this purple subunit is typically turning uh, in 120 degree steps. Now, in order to see that motion, you have to attach a micron-sized uh, dumbbell to this uh, subunit, and then you watch just from top, you watch the motion of this dumbbell, and if you then plot the position of this dumbbell, the angle as a function of time, you get, at least at low ATP, which is the blue curve, low driving, you get, you see individual 120 degree steps. And when you then look at the probabilities distribution for a certain angle after a certain time, experimentalists found these kind of curves, so again, kind of slope. And if a very simple Langevin description, just a rotational Brownian motion, driven rotational Brownian motion was valid, you can very easily prove that this probability distribution should be a straight line, and from the slope you could infer the torque, which would be nice experimentally, but 
turned out in the experiment that the slope is time dependent, as it later was in our uh, other experiment. And then the question is, do you infer the torque from the infinity value, which they suggested, or, you know, is there any relation to the torque at all? Now, we, when I saw this data, we thought about a simple model which would, which would reproduce uh, such a phenomenon. And again, it turns out that you have to look at least at two slow degrees of freedom. There is this um, big beat, and I'm mapping now the rotational motion to a linear motion. There is this big beat, and this big beat is elastically connected to this motor subunit. So the idea is that the motor jumps in 120 degree steps, and the beat coupled to that motor via an elastic element just follows its Langevin equation. And again, the motor, the motor jumps have to obey this local detail balance condition. So in the simplest case, each 120 degree step is associated with hydrolysis of an ATP, which provides delta mu of free energy. So you have to impose this condition on the rates, which makes the motor rates dependent on the position of the bead. Okay, this is a simple model. You cannot solve it analytically, but you can uh, easily simulate it. And then you get uh, exactly like in the experiment, you get this kind of distributions for the angle or for the linear advancement as a function of time. If you look at the slope, different concentrations, you get precisely what was found in the experiment. And it turns out you can easily prove that the torque is not given by this asymptotic value, but rather by the value at delta t measuring time going to zero. So you get about twice the torque than you would infer naively from this asymptotic value. So the lesson of all this, and this was just meant to be an um, introduction, is that you have to take into account all slow degrees of freedom. If there are some which you do not control, the fluctuation theorem is spoiled. And then the question is, what can you really infer from it quantitatively? And in the next step, I want to show you something which is this uncertainty relation, which will hold even when you don't have control over all degrees of freedom. <laughs> and in order to introduce this, uh, let me start with something you all know, which is the asymmetric random walk. But I want you now to look at this asymmetric random walk from a slightly different perspective. I want you to think of that as a process which turns out a product, and the product are steps. So the idea is that you have a particle or system which moves preferentially to the right. On average, after time t, it has covered this number of steps. But for fixed time, the output this number of steps will, of course, vary. It will fluctuate, so there is a variance which is given by the sum of the rates. And now I want a measure for the precision of such a process. And this is a dimensionless quantity, epsilon squared, which is the variance divided by the mean output squared. And when you work it out, trivially, you get this relation here. Of course, the longer you run it, the less the relative uh, the relative uncertainty uh, is. However, if you want this process to run preferentially to the right, you have to provide some energy. You have to be out of equilibrium. Someone has to pay for it. And this is the thermodynamic cost of this process. And it's given by the entropy production times the time, or the current times the affinity times the time, and the affinity it's just a log ratio of this forward and backward rate, which in the case where this is driven by a chemical reaction would just be the delta mu of the reaction. This is just thermodynamic consistency. And now the cute result is when you put these two things together, you find that the cost times the uncertainty squared is bounded, is given by this function, which is bounded by 2 kBT. So if you want to have a very precise process, Epsilon small, you have to pay a lot. Precision doesn't come for free. Now you might say, okay, this is nice, but it's just the asymmetric random walk. But it turns out that this result is universal. Whatever you do, you can have an arbitrarily complicated network, internal states, 
the precision, let's say, for steps along this coordinate is universally bounded by this relation. So, uh, for an example, for instance, if you want to have a process which is precise at the level of 1%, you have to invest at least 20,000 kBT. There is no other way how you could get this precision. It's completely independent of the wiring of your biochemical network producing this process. Now, uh, why is this? Uh, it's actually something we conjectured on the basis of lots of numerics, and we could prove it in special cases. It was fully proven by the MIT group a year later. You have to use 2.5 level large deviation theory, so it's a, it's a quite non-trivial result. But way of understanding why this simple asymmetric random walk case uh, is already the best, in a sense, is that if you add additional cycles to your system, more complicated wiring, typically you increase the fluctuations, the uncertainty, without really gaining something. Okay. Now, um, I want to mention that this holds even much more generally. So this, this holds for any couple of Langevin dynamics, or even for stochastic field theory. So let me briefly uh, sketch how that goes. So suppose you have a set of variables, or even fields, which obey a Langevin dynamics. So some force, not of gradient type, some noise. Whole thing is running into a steady state. You can define this mean velocity, which is the change of the beta component for a given overall set of fields. You get the mean entropy production rate, which you can write in this form using these velocities. And then you can define a current, let's say the alpha current. The alpha current is just how much the alpha field or variable changes in time. That will have a mean and that will have a fluctuation. From these fluctuations, you can define the dispersion coefficient. And then this relation holds for any current. So the total entropy production times the dispersion is always larger than the mean current squared. It's a very universal relation. You can even cook up more complicated currents. It's very general. And of course, and I'll show you now two examples, you can now use this to infer bounds on the entropy production in your system just by looking at any current and at, at the fluctuations of this current. And I'll show you now two examples how this works. First example is efficiency of a molecular motor. So this one was one of the first experiments where molecular motor was, was analyzed uh, 20 years ago in Stephen Block's lab. So what you do is you have this kinesine molecule, it's running against, along a filament, you attach a bead to it, you can apply a force on the bead via this optical tweezer, and then with the feedback mechanism, you can make sure that you apply constant force. And then what do you measure? Well, you measure the velocity of that motor, but you can also measure the dispersion or the diffusion coefficient. And then experimentalists typically look at the ratio, which is called the randomness parameter, where L is the step size of uh, one step. And then you get data like this, the randomness as a function of the ATP concentration for different loads, or as a function of the load for fixed ATP concentration. These are data. These data have been around for 20 years. Now, you can apply this um, uncertainty relation now to infer the efficiency of this kinesine molecule. How do you do that? Well, efficiency, generally speaking, is the output divided by the input. Output of a mechanical motor is for, uh, force times velocity. I mean, the force against it runs times velocity. The input is unknown. You, do not, you cannot count the number of ATP molecules this motor is using. And without knowing about its precise mechanochemical cycles, I mean, the budget has shown how complicated these cycles can be. You, you, you can't know how many ATP you need for a step. This is unknown. But on thermodynamic grounds, it's clear that the input has to be at least the output plus the entropy production. Whatever you put in and you don't get out is wasted, is dissipated. Now, we have this uh, relation we can bound the entropy production 
by a current, and as a current, we just take the output, and then we use previous relation, and you're here. And all these quantities on the right-hand side are measurable, which means that if we now take the old data and we plot this bound, we get this curve. As a function, you see the concentration of the ATP doesn't show up here, that's why these are straight lines. So for instance here, suppose this is experimental data point. We can now say that at, under these conditions, this very motor is thermodynamically efficient at most 70%, perhaps less, it's a bound. But it cannot be more efficient than that. This is the first result where someone tried to infer the efficiency of a molecular motor just based on experimental data without any additional input about how the motor works, about how the wiring of the motor is implemented biochemically. Or if you do it as a function of load, you get these kind of curves. So, for instance, here, again, this motor at these conditions is at most 45% efficient. I think this is a really cute result. Okay, one more application. Uh, I don't know how many of you followed this recent debate, recent being over the last two years, whether or not you can reach Carnot efficiency at finite power. I mean, you all know Carnot efficiency is the upper bound for a thermal engine, but typically it comes under quasi-static conditions, so there is no power, so in a sense Carnot efficiency is, is useless. But there have been various suggestions, which I have not listed here, because it's just a side remark, that for instance using a critical, um, working, critical subs, uh, flu working substance, you could reach Carnot at finite power. Now again, we can use this uncertainty relation to constrain or to bound the total entropy production for a heat engine by the work current and the fluctuations in the work current, which is the power. So again, just using the previous relation, we get that the power of any heat engine is bounded by this expression, which involves the efficiency, the Carnot efficiency, and the fluctuations, the dispersion of this work current, i.e. the power. So you see that if these fluctuations don't blow up, as the efficiency approaches Carnot efficiency, the power vanishes at least linearly. However, there is a loophole if you get power fluctuations, diverging power fluctuations, you could in principle reach Carnot at finite power. So this should settle uh, this, this ongoing debate. Okay, so, so much for this uncertainty relation, and now in the last part I want to talk about, um, let me skip that, about entropy production of active particles, and you can see on this ugly black slide, there's a long list, which is of course not complete, uh, of recent papers, I think the Bashi Shauduri was uh, one of the first uh, suggesting to look into this problem, and we heard him speaking yesterday uh, about identifying entropy production in these active systems. And I want to show you now something uh, which I did with my student, uh, which I think is a kind of a fresh approach, which also shows, uh, sheds new light on, on this debate. And of course, with my background, the idea was to come up with the simplest, or one of the simplest thermodynamically consistent models for active uh, particles. And I'll start with a discrete model. So the idea is the following. We start with a lattice. Here is the active particle. The active particle has a direction, and it can jump along this direction. Now, it doesn't jump for free, it has to be powered, and in this model, it's powered by a chemical reaction, which means that this propulsion step, the rate forward divided by the rate backward, has to obey the thermodynamic consistency relation. KBT is, is one in my talk. Okay, now suppose this active particle couldn't change the, its orientation. Then it would move preferentially in this direction, preferentially forward, so it would acquire a mean active velocity, which is just given by the difference of these rates times the lattice constant. But it would come with some fluctuations, so there is a dispersion. And in the following, rather than using k plus and k minus, I'm using u and d. 
I put not a particle into a potential, so it has to run uphill. And then these rates, of course, have to be modified for these chemical or active steps. And again, this is the thermodynamic consistency relation. Ratio of the rates has to involve the potential difference on these two sides. Okay, so now what is the entropy production associated with this active process? Well, I just take the usual rules. I take the rules for my second slide, and this is just this expression, this is the current, this is this log ratio of the rates, and now you can use the continuum limit. We now send this A to zero, keeping U, the mean velocity, and the dispersion fixed. And this is what you get. This is the gradient in the potential, N is the uh, direction of the, of the motion, D is the dispersion coefficient. Now, of course, this orientation can change. As long as this reorientation is not driven externally, it does not contribute to, energy, uh, to entropy production. This particle is embedded in an aqueous solution, so there will be also inevitably translational noise. And if you work it out, ordinary translational noise, translational diffusion will contribute this part. You add the two together, you get the total entropy production. And for this model, this is the unique answer. There is no way out. Now, you could be inclined to do what is often done, and infer it from forward and backward pathways. And for that, we first have to uh, state, or I have to give you the corresponding Langevin dynamics. So this is the Langevin dynamics for this particle, which you get in this continuum limit. Uh, so there is a propulsion along the instantaneous director. There is, uh, if it's in the potential, there is a kind of mobility, so this would be the usual translational mobility, but it turns out that due to this chemical reaction, there is also kind of active mobility, um, which you can write in this form. Now, inevitably, this in a finite temperature environment, they come with noise. So there is the usual translational noise, but also this chemical reaction has noise, and this leads to a noise in the propulsion direction. And the strength of these noises are given in the usual way by the corresponding mobilities. Okay, so again, this is the Langevin dynamics for this kind of model. And now, once you have this Langevin dynamics, you can play the usual game. You can look at time reversal. And this is something people have done for different models, active einstein uhlenbeck recently very, uh, very intensely. So let me show it just for free motion, simple case. So our model for free motion is this kind of Langevin equation, there is no potential. Now if you look at the logarithmic weight ratio of the original path compared to the, um, to the time reverse path, well there's the question, how do, you, how do you deal with this orientational vector under time reversal? And one way would be just to keep it like this. And then when you look at this log ratio, you get this expression without a potential. And this is less than what I derived earlier, because here it's the sum of these two mobilities and earlier only this expression shows up. Now, if you also reverse the orientational vector, you would look at this log ratio, which in the absence of a potential is even zero. With potential, you get this. In any case, however you do it, you do not get what I would call the physical entropy production. And why is this the case? Well, it's the case for the same reason uh, as we had in the introduction. There are two processes, two processes which contribute to noise. There's the chemical reaction, and then there's this inevitable translational diffusion. But when you look just at the Langevin equation, and I give you a trajectory, you cannot tell whether a certain increment arose from translational diffusion or from the chemical reaction. So there is some implicit cross-graining when you just look at, the, at this path without knowing the underlying microscopic, or without having the microscopic process. And therefore, you do not get all of the physical entropy production. So this Langevin equation contains this implicit uh, cross-graining. 
Uh, now, you, uh, this was just one particle, but you know you can look at many particles. And uh, for instance, if you take this situation here from uh, Ajay Sood's experiments, you have, let's say, um, passive colloidal particles. Here shown is only one, and you have these active particles. These active particles provide a bath, but from my perspective, they are just embedded in the thermal environment, and then they have this chemical reaction as a propulsion. So, I mean, it looks a little bit ugly, but basically you just add up the end contributions of the active particles, and from the passive particles, you only have this diffusive contributions. V, of course, is now the full potential, including two-body interactions between red and red and red and blue and so on. You work it out, you get this kind of expression. Now, suppose I look at a simple situation where I have only one passive particle in a harmonic trap, and I have these active particles, and the interaction, the mutual interaction is just hardcore repulsion. That's the simplest case. And then you get for total entropy production, from this expression you get this. Rho is the available space, phase space volume uh, for all particles, and from the potential, I mean the potential now is only the harmonic potential for the passive particle, you get this expression. In equilibrium, R squared is 3, K, 3 over K, K is the strength of the potential, but of course, in non-equilibrium, the red particles push that further uphill, and when it slides down, it dissipates this kind of, this kind of energy. So this is now a formalism which you can apply to any kind of interacting passive and active particles, and you get, in my opinion, a unique form of the total entropy production. Okay. Um, of course, this can be further generalized. You could take, for instance, rod-like particles, which have a uh, anisotropic uh, diffusion coefficient. I looked at one chemical reaction, but of course, you could have different chemical reactions, or you could have different channels indexed by rho, each with its mean velocity and its dispersion. You could also add a further internal degree of freedom and then, within such an approach, you could model these active von stein uhlenbeck processes or particles, which currently are very much uh, en vogue. Okay, so, I mean, this is something which I started, uh, but I wanted to show it here because I think it fits uh, to the topic of this, of this workshop, and it also uh, relates to some of the things we have heard and we will hear here uh, during this week. So, how am I doing? Okay. Two more minutes. Okay, so this will be this will be brief. Um, about a year ago, we looked into extreme fluctuations of active particles. So, um, as I showed you, this relation, uh, this uncertainty relation, involves the average current and the second moment of the current. But there is a version of it which involves or which bounds the whole rate functions for any current by a parabolic. Uh, by a parabolic function where the curvature is given by the entropy production. So it's interesting and important to look also at the extreme fluctuation, not just at mean and dispersion. And this is what we, what we did in this work. And again, we were interested in the general features of the large deviation function for the displacement, which I call H here. And it turned out that, for instance, if you have a model which has different internal states, so for instance, the motor could be on a track or it could be detached, and there are transition between these internal states, and then you assume that the active force depends on the inter internal state. And then, once you are in a given internal state, you just have this kind of Lorentz equation. Um, now, when you calculate the rate function, you find uh, basically two scenarios. If the transition rate between the internal states is very fast, then you get effectively just a parabolic uh, rate function with an effective diffusion coefficient, which is the weighted sum of the individual ones. So this would be, this would be the blue curves here. This is the rate function. Now, if you have a very slow switching, then you could have the uh, in each internal state, you have your parabola centered around the mean velocity, 
And then the overall rate function for slow switching is the convex envelope of these two parabolas. So this is, such, again, the general scenario. For slow switching, you have convex envelope. For fast switching, you have a parabolic one. And you can generalize this further, but I'll skip over this and just show you my summary slide. I'm not going through that, but I rather want to take uh, the remaining time for questions. Thank you. In the context of the motors that you yes. analyzed, there are two efficiencies that were defined originally, the thermodynamic one and the stochastian one. It yes. appears to me that the one that you have now is a sort of a combination or a unified one because you have the sigma in the denominator, no. not delta mu. No, this is really the thermodynamic one. This is not the Stokesian one. No, the Stokesian one. I mean, if the thermodynamic one, then it should have only the delta mu, the chemical uh, potential and uh, of ATP. Yes, yes, yes. But I mean, OK, this is an important point. Uh, so you're right. The thermodynamic efficiency is the output divided by the input. The output is force times velocity, and the input is the delta mu per time. I don't know this, but the first law tells me that this is the output plus what is wasted. Or you could say what is wasted is the input minus the output. So this, and this was the expression I was bounding. So this is a relation on the thermodynamic one. Uh, can you use the same uh, efficiency formula for the active particle? Active, active particle. Yeah. Uh, well, OK, so, um, well, it's a good question, uh, efficiency. So these are the expressions for the total entropy production, right? Now, I mean, efficiency, you would have to let this active particle do some useful work. So you would have to attach a weight to it. And then we're essentially back at something like this. In this, in this very situation where you don't have an, uh, a, a physical output, in my opinion, efficiency is zero. Yeah, it, it, it burns ATP and it doesn't deliver anything but beautiful trajectory. Uh, well, we have, you can put it in a potential, but that will not help because in a potential it will just have a time-dependent internal energy, but again, no mechanical output. You see, you have to couple it to, to some constant thermodynamic force. Uh, but of course, if you tell me uh, how you couple it, then with this I can tell you what the efficiency is, yes. In the first part of your talk, you probably said it, and I would like to know again, when the fluctuation relation is not obeyed by yes. changing some parameter of the system, yes. what does it physically imply? The degrees of freedom are getting coupled or what? It means, it means that you have calculated the entropy production on, by not including all relevant observables. You see, in this, in this double ring situation, um, you drive. So, I mean, if, if I hide the second ring from you, from the experimentalist, you only have access to these data, that's basically what you would do. I mean, you would, you would, you would just use the usual rules. And then you would not, yeah, well, you would not have included that. You would not have, and even if you don't drive that one, you would still get the wrong result. You would not get the fluctuation theorem because this is low degree of freedom, which also dissipates and which you do not take into account when you just look at this, this trajectory. But you see, so far we cannot conclude anything quantitative from this violation. That's in my sense the drawback since 10 years. And that's why I'm so happy about this new relation because there we can make quantitative predictions even when we don't, even when we don't have access to all degrees of freedom. Is this the unique reason or could there be other reasons that not including some other degrees of freedom? Uh, well, if you don't include other degrees of freedom, that's certainly bad. Um, 
let's say, you know, if you had non-Markovian effects, that would be bad. But of course, in my perspective, this just means that you have not resolved, again, the motion in sufficient uh, time detail. So you have, you know, non-Markovianity always arises from coarse graining about something which you have hidden. Thank you. Um, so so you, have a, you have shown these efficiencies for the kinesine motors yes. that you've extracted, and there are quite a couple of models, more specific models yes. on the market. Have you yes. looked at those? I mean, can you rule, rule out certain models, like could bounce on these models? Uh, we haven't looked at it under, under this, in this perspective, but of course we have applied it to our model, the hybrid model. That's, so in, in our model, if you, plot, if you plot here the force at fixed delta mu, so if you plot the efficiency in the, in the simple, strongly coupled model, the efficiency is just linear in the force. Because in strong coupling, for each step, you spend one ATP. Now, this is the true result in our hybrid model, but and when we look at the bound, we get for this upper bound something like this. So this is the bound, and this is the true efficiency. So for this, I mean, I'm exaggerating here, it looks more like this. But for this model we have done so, it's a good suggestion, no, but we haven't looked at models on the market, and, uh, it, but it would be a way to exclude certain models, certainly, yeah. That's yeah, just a, a quick uh, clarification, like when you define this efficiency, this, this is a, that's P out by P in, so, uh, so yeah. this is that uh, mean efficiency you are defining, yes. right? So do you define by the average of this object or like taking the average on the numerator and denominator separately? Oh, no, these, these, are, these are averages. This is average work out divided by time. This is average work in divided by time. I know that some people like to talk about st stochastic efficiency. I don't. Because as you know, in stochastic efficiency, this can be easily zero and then you get infinity. This can be minus epsilon, then you get minus infinity for this either. So, my opinion, it's, uh, yes. Any other question? Yeah. I mean, in one of the uh, figures that you had shown, you had several, uh, I mean, complicated network. Yes. And so if there are more than one cycle, I mean, more than one pathway completing the cycle. Yes. Ah, this one. So uh, then it still remains 2KT or N times 2KT where no, 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 is the number? No, 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 it's always 2KBT. It's always 2KBT and it holds for any current. So you could, you could take the current through just one link. You could take the current through a cycle. You could take a linear combination of cycle currents. It holds true for any current. So basically for any object which is extensive in time and anti-symmetric. Yeah, so for each conjugate pair, it will be one, I mean, two KBT, but if I yeah. have taken all of them. Then well, it holds for each current individually. Okay. But you're not allowed to add it. Because you see, this dispersion is not additive. And the squares are not additive either, so. So, uh, so you mentioned non-Markovian uh, thing. So, yeah. what is the situation? I mean, like, is it generally known that uh, once you have non-Markovian dynamics, it's not valid, or what is the situation? Um, I, I, I think in general it's not it's not valid. But of course, if you can substitute your Markovian model by some additional degrees of freedom, and if you include those or calculate those, then it would be valid again. Yeah, for exponential noise, yeah. I mean, you know, it might be valid, but it's not then not covered by the usual proof. Uh, it, it, I think it's still open. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really work much on it, and I may, something may have escaped my attention. Okay, I, I have just one clarification. So when you showed the experimental data for the efficiencies for the motor, yes, right, it seems to be tapering off at around 60%. Uh, Am I right about that? Um, Does it? Okay, or, let me show it. Oh, that's the randomness. So it seems to be taper off around 70% efficiency. 70%? Here is 70%? Yes. Here is 60? You mean asymptotically yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you see, I mean, 
the more ATP you provide, at the end of the day, um, I mean, basically, this is concentration, right? And then there's some bottlenecks, so you cannot, you, even if you provide more, you cannot use more because you're constrained in your, on your pathway, and then this would just become constant. But, but uh, you know, I don't think it's particular that it becomes constant at around 60. And again, this is an upper bound. I mean, this could well be just at 15%. It's just an upper yeah. bound. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, yes, exactly. I mean, it's clear that it cannot go on, but whether it, it you know, whether it's 60 or 70 or 40, it's certainly a non-universal thing.